Hi everybody, welcome. Please come in, have a seat. Yeah, any seat's fine, just take your pick. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for coming. My name is Hyacinth Merriweather, and I am one of the curators at the Fairy Tale Museum. If you've been there recently, you've undoubtedly seen me scurrying around uh, the museum facilities, uh, tending to the various objects that we have there. So, uh, when the Fairy Tale Institute uh, got in touch with me and asked me to do this, I was absolutely over the moon uh, for the simple fact that normally I'm behind the scenes and uh, I don't really get a chance to interact with the public as much as I would like. So I was thrilled at the fact that I'd finally be able to kind of talk to you all about these objects that uh, I am so enamored with and have basically dedicated my life to uh, protecting and informing others about. So uh, let me just refer to my book here. I'll be referring to my manual every now and again just because... Um, I'm new to this whole teaching thing. Um, let me see here. Well, I, as you all know, this course itself is mainly about authenticating and valuing um, these rare artifacts that we've brought with us today. It will teach you how to kind of evaluate them and appraise them. So uh, if you're interested in a museum internship, or becoming a curator one day, or even if you're just uh, kind of interested in becoming a collector of rare objects in the fairy tale realm, uh, this will kind of be right up your alley. Um, now this is for beginners, so it's not going to be anything too advanced, we're just going to be going over the basics, and I will do my very best to uh, kind of share all the information I know about each particular object with you. Um, as, I'm, as I said, I'm kind of new to this, so... <laughs> Excuse me if I falter a bit. So, um, as you can see on the desk in front of me, I have a wide range of fairy tale artifact objects with me. So, um, I'm going to just be showing them all to you. I'm, I'm wearing a pair of uh, cloth gloves because a lot of these are very fragile and I wouldn't want my fingerprints to transfer any oils or debris onto them. So you'll also notice that there are two guards standing at the door uh, armed with wands but uh, they are <laughs> not here by in any means to discourage you from kind of asking questions or interacting with the objects that can be interacted with. They are just here to kind of discourage those who might um, want to cause any harm to the artifacts. Uh, the past few months we've had a couple of break-ins and one of the artifacts has actually been damaged in the process so we're taking extra precautions now whenever we loan out any of the artifacts or have exhibitions or anything of that sort. So I just wanted to let you all know that. Alright, so... The first artifact I will be showing you... Uh, oh, before I begin, are there any questions? No? Okay, well if there are any questions along the way, just... Uh, please feel free to raise your hand, and I'll be more than happy to answer them to the best of my knowledge, okay? okay. So, this first artifact here, um, as you can tell, it's an absolutely stunning brush. Uh, it has a porcelain handle and a gilded kind of silver embellishments all around it. Uh, for any of those, for those of you who have been into the museum, you'll have noticed this right away probably because it's our main exhibit in the, uh, the main room that we have. And it's uh, Rapunzel's brush. So this 
this is not a replica, this was the actual brush that uh, was with her in the tower when she was uh, basically held captive there. So, uh, as you can see, uh, even from where you're sitting probably, her strands are absolutely uh, luminous, so you'll be able to see the blonde strands in there. Yes, they are quite long, of course. And it, even if it weren't an enchanted brush and didn't belong to such a notable character, the brush itself is simply stunning. Um, the craftsmanship that was put into it is just utterly remarkable, I feel. And um, we've had a a couple of counterfeit brushes that have come into the museum, people trying to sell them uh, as Rapunzel's original brush, and of course we own the original, but um, they weren't aware of that evidently at the time. But they didn't have the same weight and, of course, the same kind of authentic touches here and there. For instance, a lot of the copies that you'll see uh, do not have this rose embellishment in the handle because it's often not visible uh, to the naked eye. You often have to shine it under a candlelight of some sort in order to make it out. So Now this particular brush was uh, kind of bequested by Rapunzel herself. Uh, a few years after she was uh, rescued from the tower, she actually gave it to us. Uh, I think it's mainly because it was just linked to uh, a myriad of memories that she'd rather not forget. And that's my personal uh, take on it anyway. But regardless of why it was given to us, we are so happy to have it. And um, it's one of our most treasured artifacts that we have on display at the museum, uh, most assuredly. Now this one is in a glass jar, and if any of you, can, I don't know if you can see it at the back, everybody see it? Okay. It's actually a, uh, the pea from The Princess and the Pea. <laughs> yes. It's hermetically sealed in this glass jar, and of course it has an enchantment spell on it to preserve it, or else it probably would have dried out and <laughs> been just a speck by now. Uh, as you all know, this was the pea that sat under an entire stack of mattresses and uh, allowed the princess to pass uh, the test when she was bruised. Now, this was actually given to us by the queen who provided the test, so uh, she didn't have a need for it anymore, evidently, but we definitely wanted it, so we actually had to pay for this one. Uh, quite a pretty penny, but uh, it was worth every cent. Now this is in our uh, left wing of the museum. This is normally where it's stored. And it's not one of our most popular artifacts on display, but it's one of my favorites simply because uh, it's so beautifully simple and it kind of symbolizes something so delicate and so so unique, so I really like this particular artifact. Now, as you can imagine, there are a variety of, of people who try to pass off other normal peas for this particular pea. So we've actually had, I think I've lost count, I think 22 people who've come in uh, over the years trying to claim that they have the actual P and uh, this P you can tell from the others because the Queen actually, oddly enough, had it engraved. So if you can see, almost branded, so if you can see there, let me kind of, there you go. I'll put it on uh, under the magnifier here so if you just look up on the screen you can see it. As you can see, she's kind of trademarked it there, so it has her initials, 
and V. So you can always tell this P from the others because uh, the MV is very uh, distinguishable and it's very hard to duplicate the exact font that she used and the exact uh, engraving method and so on. So, And very few people on top of that know that it was actually engraved. So that's one key way to tell this from uh, the forgeries. Now this particular P is worth roughly 350 gold pieces. And of course your traditional P would be, you know, a cent or two, so, if even that. So, of course, this is uh, much more valuable. Uh, oh, and I did forget to mention the brush that I showed you earlier. That is actually uh, one of our most expensive pieces, and it's uh, 3,500 gold pieces, so that's quite a sizable amount there. So, again, the P isn't one of our most popular and not our most expensive or valuable piece either, but I just love it. I think it's so quirky. Mm -hmm. familiar with mythology, this, uh, you probably recognize this right away, this is Pandora's box. Now, Pandora's box, I'd have to say is our oldest piece that we have at the museum. It, it dates back roughly four centuries, um, if not much further than that. quite unique uh, for the simple fact that it's one of our most dangerous pieces as well. Um, there's no telling what it holds. Uh, none of us curators or uh, the patrons or anybody really has ever had the nerve to open it or take a peek inside simply for the lore that has uh, kind of preceded this box. So it's extremely valuable. It's roughly 2,750 gold pieces, thereabouts, give or take a few. It's actually one of the few pieces that we have that does not originate from uh, one of the uh, realms that immediately surround us. So it's not from the Enchanted Forest, or Neverland, or Wonderland. So it's one of the few that come from a place of origin that we are quite unsure of still, and there are various curators at the museum who have been studying various aspects of the box to try to determine where it exactly came from, but no one is quite sure. So that's quite remarkable in and of itself. Um, there have been quite a few people uh, in to the museum claiming that they had the box, and of course they were forgeries. Uh, we can tell that this is the original uh, because it has an intricate design kind of embossed in the bottom of it here. You can see, let me hold it up to the magnifier. And of course when you look at the box itself in the exhibit, this is not revealed. And so we've had quite a few people who come in, but the box does not have this intricate design on the bottom as the original does. If you can see here on the lid, there are quite a few fairies, and these fairies are very hard to duplicate. Uh, they, they almost glow, and we think, although we're not quite certain, we do think there are remnants of fairy dust uh, in the etching itself. So there has been some speculation that Pandora's box originally came from a, a fairy realm, but we aren't quite sure where. So, let's see here, what's next? Oh, this is one of my favorite pieces. Okay. If you 
see here. This is one of Captain Hook's discarded uh, hook instruments. So, as you can see, it's, it's very rusted, so it's prior to when he began using stainless steel, and it rusted very easily, so it's very fragile, and we are always careful to keep this in a room which is climate controlled, and we must always handle it with these gloves, of course. And this was given to us by Hook himself. Uh, he didn't have a need for it anymore, so he donated it to us. And oddly enough, we thought he would be charging, since pirates typically do try to <laughs> make the most of every opportunity, but uh, evidently he was in a good mood that day. So uh, he bestowed it upon us, and we're very grateful for it. Now, it's been rumored that this particular hook was the one that was involved in the infamous battle with Peter Pan, which took place roughly 230 years ago, but that cannot be substantiated. We've actually gotten into contact with Pan himself, but he was not able to identify whether uh, or not this particular hook was the one that was involved. So, yes, for now we're saying it's the alleged uh, hook that was involved in the battle itself, but uh, of course we cannot prove that. We cannot lay claim to that, so. Uh, we've had several uh, appraisers and curators come in to have a look at it, and none of them can reach a consensus about it, so we've, have, we've had to leave it at that. Now this hook, uh, it's roughly 1,250 gold pieces, um, that's what we've had it appraised at most recently. Um, there is some talk that if we are able to prove the story behind it, that it could become one of our most valuable pieces, even surpassing Rapunzel's brush. But again, um, there's no sign that we're going to be able to authenticate that particular story anytime soon, unless we can come up with some new evidence. So. Okay, let me see here. Uh, okay, let me see here. Again, this is another glass jar. Uh, we usually keep our edible or perishable items in glass jars that have been enchanted uh, so that they stay intact. This is our, without a doubt, most popular piece at the museum. If you see, uh, yep, it's the infamous apple. And, this, and if you look very close, you can actually see the nibble that uh, Snow White took out of it. And it's been preserved, so uh, there's no browning or decay of any sort, thankfully. Now, uh, this is about the same value as Rapunzel's brush. Um, as I said, though, it is our most popular. We keep it in the main room, uh, very near the brush itself, actually, because they, uh, we seem to have a lot of visitors coming in for these two particular items. Now, the apple was given to us by Snow White herself. Um, she was there for the dedication of it when we unveiled the exhibit, and it was quite an exciting time. We had all of the notable fairy, fairy tale characters in attendance, so it was amazing. One of the highlights of my career. I had uh, the honor of authenticating this myself, and uh, I will say it was rather difficult for the simple fact that uh, when we received it, it was kind of in a poor state. Uh, it wasn't preserved at all, of course, so it was uh, on its way to spoiling completely, but we were able to revive it through the power of magic, of course, and uh, place it in this glass jar here. So I really had to kind of see the diamond in the rough, and there were a few of us who actually 
were given the opportunity to uh, have a look at it, but uh, it came down to me and I had to have the final say as to whether or not it was the real deal, I guess you could say. And um, the thing that set it apart from the rest uh, was, if you look very closely, there's a tiny speck of red lipstick right there in the center of the nibble of the bite out of the apple. And I could tell right away that that was the particular shade that Snow White typically wore because it just so happened that we did have a few other objects in the museum itself. Either pictures, photographs, paintings, uh, and various objects of hers that actually depicted the same shade. So I could tell that it was hers and it wasn't a fake. So that was quite exciting. Alright, and there's going to... Uh, let me see, I think just a couple more artifacts to show you today. Now let me try to put this one on the desk. Okay, this is one of our largest pieces. This is the spindle that was used by Rumpelstiltskin himself to spin gold. So, uh, oddly enough, it is not very valuable. It's only worth 250 gold pieces, which is still a sizable sum. But uh, when compared to some of our other smaller artifacts, it's not, it's not as valuable. Which I feel is very strange, but I suppose that... Um, Given his ill nature, there is kind of a negative connotation associated with this particular object, so... Uh, I think it's absolutely stunning. Uh, if you can see here, it's been, been very well preserved. There is no wood rot at all, which is remarkable. And there's a variety of gorgeous designs etched into it. Uh, I think it's beautiful and uh, quite sophisticated. <laughs> strangely. Now, uh, we haven't had any weavers or loomers come in to try to uh, use the spindle. We've kept it securely locked up and out of use because we wouldn't want uh, any damage to befall it. So we're not quite sure if it does still work, but uh, just given the condition of everything and just the care that was taken, of the maintenance of it when it was in his possession. Well, we're, we're pretty sure that it, it would still work if we tried it out. Um, now when it comes to enchanted wooden objects, you can always authenticate them based upon the quality of the design and the wear that's been placed on the object itself. For instance, uh, if you run into a wooden forgery, often they will try to place kind of inauthentic wear upon it, making it look as if it's old, but it's really not, of course. So this one, it's worn in just the right places, as you can see. And the design itself, it's aged very well, but you can tell it's aged naturally. So that's normally how I tell uh, the fakes from the real thing. Now this was bestowed to us from his family, uh, not uh, Rumpelstiltskin himself. Uh, but they wanted us to have it because they felt it was an important part of their family's legacy. And um, I have to say it kind of stands as a testament to the fact that even if you have some negative aspects in your family tree, or some uh, bad apples, I guess you could say, that uh, it's still important to honor your family and your lineage. So I, I think this is a great piece, kind of a symbolic piece, and it's it's beautifully aesthetically as well. So, all right, now let's look at our last object. Now this particular, I guess they saved the best for last. This particular artifact is. I, I try not to play favorites with the objects that we have in the museum, but this, I'd have to say, I'll admit it's one of my favorites. 
it's not from a fairy tale character per se, and I think that's why I love it so much because it is unlike anything else that we have. Uh, this is actually the diary that was left behind from uh, when the Grimm brothers came to stay with us. And as you all know, uh, the legend of the Grimm brothers, they weren't exactly invited. They kind of uh, snuck their way in. Uh, and during their escape, <laughs> Uh, they actually left a few things behind, but nothing has really survived the test of time. It was either destroyed or um, fell into the wrong hands, that sort of thing. But this is one of the few things that we were able to preserve. And if you see in here, absolutely magnificent illustrations and different things they jotted down about what they discovered here and they were here for, we believe, based upon this diary, for approximately two and a half months. Um, we can't be certain because we, we are unsure as to whether they, when exactly they started the diary and if the last entry was truly when they left uh, or not. So uh, judging by the diary, though, we've had several people, of course, assess it and things of that nature. And we assume that it was about two and a half months. But, uh, it's an absolutely stunning book. Uh, it's just the, the paper itself is very thick and of heavy weight, and it's it's just, the book itself is is of high craftsmanship. But then you have it and all of the contents inside of it just kind of put it above and beyond anything else, uh, anything that I've ever seen anyway. So it's one of my favorite pieces. Now we've never had anyone try to forge anything remotely like this for the simple fact that no one really knows what's inside. Uh, they can guess and, you know, take educated hypotheses about it, but no one really knows what's inside except for those of us who have seen it, and even those of us who have seen it cannot remember everything that's within it. Uh, it's kept under lock and key, and of course it's stored in, an, again, in a climate-controlled room because we don't want the pages to Kind of disintegrate, and um, there is really no price that we can put upon it. Uh, we've tried to guess at estimates, and they've been in the 5,000, 6,000 range, but uh, no one for sure can put a price tag on it because it is one of a kind, and there's really nothing to base it on. So, uh, that's it for the last artifact. But I'd like to invite you all to come up here and kind of take an up-close look. Uh, there are a couple of things that you can touch, such as the things in the glass jars, but we do ask you to even wear gloves for those. And I will be up here to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, if you're interested, I will be back in a few weeks offering um, another magical artifact course, uh, which you'll be eligible for. It will be for more advanced learners. So. Uh, since you took this beginning course, you can, you're more than welcome to sign up for that. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all in the future.